Let's do it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of Catholic Recon Testimonies from Reverts and Converts. I'm your host, Eddie Trask. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to share videos and comment on videos. I really, really appreciate those that chime in and share their personal stories, those that have reached out um, wanting to share their testimonies. It is absolutely crucial. I've mentioned this before, but I want to mention it again before introducing this week's guest. And that is we need even more people um, that are willing to share a story. I don't care if it's 15 minutes. I don't care if it's an hour and a half. Um, many people out there have a story on their hearts, a testimony on their hearts, and maybe they're not even aware that there are channels that hear these types of things. Um, so if you know anyone like that, please uh, refer them to my channel, other channels, whoever's hearing testimony so we can continue to get the word out and defend the faith. <laughs> this week's guest is Eric Tafoya. And I'm not even going to, I'm just going to leave it there. Eric Tafoya, we're going to get into everything that you do, brother, um, your past, your present, your future. Why don't we start as we start every interview? Go back to childhood, early childhood, maybe teen years. You tell me whatever is relevant to your story. And, th and thank amen, you for being amen. here too. And thank, thank, you you, thank you for having me. It's an honor here, everybody out there and out there, all my Catholic brothers and sisters, God bless you. And even my brothers and sisters out there that aren't Catholic. Testimonies are major. They're huge. It's I like how you brought that up right now. You want to like, because testimonies are what points to God. Like it says in Matthew, um, let your good work, get, let your light show that all men may see your good works. And so bring glory to your father who is in heaven. It's important to share. We need to get out there and share because there's somebody's been through what you've been through. You don't have to be this high time preacher. You don't got to be this Scott Hahn. No, you could just be your regular mom or dad. You could just be this beautiful person who is raising their family. You have a testimony. Your story brings God glory because you've been through a lot of things in your life. So I just want to back up my brother right here. And so if anybody's watching, you have a story. That's what it's all about. And so, yeah, like I once again, I just want to tell you, thank you, Jesus, for allowing me to be right here. Thank you for allowing me to have life in my lungs and to be here with you right now, brother. Hey, thank you. He died first on the cross. What bigger testimony than that, you know? So I just want to tell you, thank you, so I can share what God has done in my life. And not just, yeah, God majorly, but Christ through his church and through the sacraments, what they've done in my life. And uh, thank you for having me here. Well said, well said. So where would you like to start? Where, where, where does your story, when you share your testimony, where does it start for you? You know, it, it starts for me right now is because you got to go back. Because a lot of times if I just paint the picture that I was this devil or that I was this demon, people don't realize, well, oh, man, he was kind of just born like that. But it, it wasn't just it wasn't always like that. So, you know, growing up, kind of had the normal life. Things things were pretty good. Um, I had a good mom. But my mom, my dad was a drug addict. He was a gang member. He, he lived that life, and he and my dad was a beautiful person, so I'm not even knocking him. My dad was my roll dog. We were like this for, for many years, for many years. Rest in peace, his soul. He died four years ago from colon cancer. So pray for me, Dad, or Dad, I'm praying for you. Absolutely. Whatever it is. Well, yeah, I, I Where'd, you grow, where'd you grow up? Where'd you grow up? I grew up in San Bernardino, California. So it's um, poor demographics, very poor. Um, they have like, there's a good areas, of course, like every city has its bad areas, but we went bankrupt back in 2008, but I've kind of lived everywhere, you know, from a young age, from about 12 years old, I've lived everywhere, San Bernardino, San Diego, um, New Mexico, Kansas, Arizona, Northern California, Redding, Sacramento, Los Angeles, you know, just always not having the right direction. Always being caught up because at a young age, to go back why it was like that, young age started using drugs. I was very rebellious. You know, it wasn't just like, oh, my mom was a bad mom. No, she wasn't because my brother's a cop, you know, so he was a good boy growing up. 
why would I make these choices out of a rebellion? Um, that's just the imperfection of original sin. Not having my dad in my life by that time. Because by that time, I'd already seen him get in shootouts. I've already seen him come home bloodied. I'd already seen him slamming heroin. And I love my dad. Rest his soul. I'm not totally not knocking him at all. I was My dad loved me. He always believed in me. You know, he really, he really did. Um, but seeing all this at a young age has its effects on you. Yeah. And so being the fact that those had those effects on me, it's the reason why I started being rebellious like I did, especially when my dad was no longer in my life when they separated. So what, how old were you when that happened? When And when did you, so, is that immediately when you started doing drugs? No, so like at three years old. So it's a trip with this one because the first person I ever did drugs with, they probably separated when I was like four years old. Oh, okay. We'd see each other off and on and then my mom took off. And then for about seven years in San Diego, we didn't see my dad. And so then, you know, God worked it in a way to where it was like, I didn't see him. I was becoming rebellious. I went back to, I ran away from home. I went to go live with him, started using drugs, started breaking into houses, started robbing people. You know, I, this isn't nothing to be proud of everything I'm saying, but I stabbed somebody in their neck so I could get this IE. It's a gang tattoo on my chest right here. Inland Empire, you know, it's something to be proud of, but I'm just telling you the yeah. where I came from. Absolutely. My dad didn't know no better. My dad didn't know no better. He was a drug addict from 18 years old. So that leads me on to getting locked up and not having a good relationship with my mom, with my family, living from place to place, being homeless, getting locked up at 13, gangs, being involved in gangs at a young age, just extremely lost, extremely confused, was not a direction that I was choosing. But because I had been around all these demons now in my life, I was just getting worse, being incarcerated, being around drug addicts. It started influencing my mind. I started becoming a, a monster inside. I started not believing in God. I started hating everybody around me. And then being sexually abused, you know, because you're around this drug lifestyle. And I'm the young one still. Being sexually abused by multiple people. Um, all those things, things had an effect that over sexualized me at a young age. It had its effects on me, the drug scene, the music, all the rap that was going on through the 90s was garbage to the end of the 90s. You know, just really pulled you in another direction. People don't realize the effects that music actually has. We need to really watch what our children is listening to watch what our children are watching and don't take it for granted oh no it's just a song or it's just a cartoon no 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 you're not seeing what's being in that if you see that you can't brush it off because bottom line is it's being filtered into them at that moment some kind of spirit that's not of god these thoughts are being filtered and that's what happened to me uh, it's just it's just the reality of the truth started getting locked up living everywhere just didn't believe in God and hated life. I wanted to hurt everybody. I, I left the path of destruction. I'm not lying. I, I asked God to forgive me. A lot of times I'm like, Lord, please. I remember things. I remember people, women that maybe I had heard in my life growing up, um, just a, a horrible individual manipulating and using people. That's all I was taught. That's what I knew. You know, and poor my mom on the side, always praying for me and one of my grandmas. My mom's not Catholic. I was baptized Catholic, but I wasn't raised Catholic. So my mom would go to like Calvary Chapel okay. on Christmas or Easter. So it was there, some kind of um, Christianity, um, but it wasn't really a part of our life. It wasn't a lifestyle. Um, it wasn't a, but Jesus wasn't really transparent and real in our life. So in I got to ask you this, yeah, go for it. In, your, in your teenage years, so you're like in and out of jail? It's, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> from, so for from how many age, years? How many years was this so, happening? So from the age of 13 all the way to the age of 30, uh, 35, I I was getting incarcerated. There wasn't one year that I spent out of, out like for one year. I would always be incarcerated. So I wouldn't be in, locked up the entire year, but I'd get locked up for maybe 10 days, a week, two weeks, a couple months. But there wasn't a, from the age of 13 to about 35, 36 years old, I never spent more than few months out i would always get locked up always get locked up could never get clean i would never get sober yeah so what and, and that's what i was going to ask you was it all based on that the fact that you come out and it's not that it was more comfortable to be 
incarcerated, but there was something that was, you'd end up back on drugs and then it would be easy to commit crimes. Is that what you're saying? Or I'm just trying to understand, like, yeah, you know, because, you know, you're when you're living that type of lifestyle, and I believe when you are um, demonically um, possessed, when you are saying things to the devil at times, saying like, yeah, you can have my soul. Let me do this at a young age, you know, going through, <clears throat> excuse me, yeah, going sorry. through very, going going through various events in my life. And I'm like, dude, if you let me, if you let me get this guy, if you let, because, you know, like, for instance, one of my friends getting shot, you know, and I'm like, if you let me get this guy, devil, I swear. I'll give you my soul. And yeah, of course I would get the guy, you know, and what's this where we would, we would inflict some pain on him and we would hurt him. And, and I would do that multiple times in my life, you know? And so I would want, and the, so now that as I'm getting older and I'm starting getting more into it, getting more, a little more into demonology and who we are as battling a fight, a spiritual warfare, not a physical warfare with the spiritual warfare. And I have good friends like Jesse Romero and, you know, Terry Barber and Father Chad Ripringer stuff I've been listening to and you, America's Bishop, Bishop Strickland, his eminence. <laughs> America's uh, yeah, just, Bishop. I love it. Yeah, yeah, just being able to have moments where I've been around them and had conversations with him, especially with him too, 15 minute conversations. It's a blessing. Yeah. Back to what I was saying, the demons were they were here they were they were i was calling them upon myself where i was living i remember just a quick story so you'll know i remember being in a in a house in a garage when i was like 12 years old 13 years old and my dad and nothing against my dad like i'm saying i'm just telling stories yeah i love my dad yeah he, he we had long a lot of talks before he passed on he knew where he was going he knew his maker he knew Christ. He was baptized and confirmation and all that, even though he had fallen away from the church for a long time. So and just so and you know, so and, I, just, and, and just so you know, and other and other people know, I've mentioned this before. You bringing up the past, mentioning family things or current things. If you're di you, everyone can tell by your disposition, by the way you're speaking, that you're not disparaging anyone. You're just saying it for the context of the of the story. Just so you know. Oh, that. Thanks, thanks, man. I have, I appreciate it because every time I do bring up that. He's a, every time I do something, it's always like, it's not just me doing it, but I always think about the one who never was able to get sober. Absolutely. I always think about the one who was ne never able to overcome, the one who would call me um, Pastor David before he died. Oh, and he would call me that. Yeah, yeah, I was in prison. He was out here, but he would. And I, I, I don't take that with the grain of with the grain of salt at all, you know, but just getting locked up um, at a young age. Um, being involved with gangs at a young age, it's just took me in the opposite direction of God. I always thought I could just rely on myself. I just need me, myself, my homies, or whatever friends are with me. And so I really had a a, a deep hate for God. I remember being an acid at times and just like, you know what? Me versus you. Like, it's pouring rain, monsoon season in Phoenix, Arizona. I've taken like five tabs of acid and because there's already this deep, like, hurt for God inside of me or a brokenness inside of me when I start getting high instead of enjoying my high and having a good time or the trip, whatever we want to call it, the trip from the LSD, I go on a rant and rave walking for miles in Phoenix, Arizona, just mad at God. You know what? F words, excuse my language, everybody out there, but you know, just very four letter words. That I don't want to repeat again. Five letter words too. And just like just going at it with him. You want me? You got beef with me. This is this is somebody who's proclaiming to be agnostic. This is someone who's proclaiming to be atheist, having all these fights, being up for like three weeks at a time and being like, what's up, God? And where I'm on crystal meth, just going on my bad trips. I did crystal meth for years. I started using crystal when I was 13 and thank God I've been sober for eight years now. Oh. It was eight, eight years um, on last Saturday, eight years last Saturday on the 19th. Praise on God the 19th. for that. My yeah. yeah, and that, it, That's only God can do that, you know, and just like every woman that I would date, I would womanize and I would hurt. No, God wasn't in my life. I just want to say that I was opposite of God. So hurting people, path of destruction. I just, I didn't care who I hurt. I was very selfish. I, ah, sometimes when I think about it, it's like, thank you. That's why I thank him so much. I have to remind myself what he did all the time, you know, because, you know, life, life can be life. And then we have to remember, man, 
Oh, but yep. remember he did this. Yep. But remember he did this. That ain't nothing yep. compared to life. You know. It's <laughs> so true. Good. Great point. Great point. No matter what the heck you've done yeah. at any season of your life, every human needs to pause and look back and remember, <laughs> consistently remember what yeah. he has done and what he's doing. Oh my gosh, yeah. our, our our memories are so uh i don't know it's just sad sometimes where you don't you don't pause to go back because i don't know you just move on with life but very important point okay so you're doing drugs in and out of prison if you can speak just a little bit to being in the the, the how many stints did you have in actual prison well i had actually three prison stints and so very actively gang member 300 men riots, forced to stab people, forced to beat people up. Sometimes when they just wanted you to put hands on somebody rather than stabbing them. But there's some places where if you say, for instance, you take something, say, say you're a Hispanic man and you take something from a black guy. They're like, hey, you want this? You can have it. You take it from him. Somebody sees you doing that. That's Hispanic. You're going to get stabbed. They won't even what in certain, <laughs> certain play because you're not allowed to take from black and hispanic races they're separated you know if you're if you want to be if you want to be christian in there but you know there's then there's then there's different levels the higher level you are of course the a lot scarier it is i didn't like stabbing people i didn't like hurting people um it wasn't my thing it just became a natural rush because it was more than me hurting somebody it was me defending myself yep i think you start realizing that i got to play this game <laughs> And I got to put on this character so that I can survive I, well, yeah. I'm, while I'm in there, you know, well, so I can survive. Because bottom line, I was a little different. I wasn't always like this cholo, um, you know, but when you go to prison, especially You're, who I ran with, yep. I ran with the cholos. I was a sureño. I was a sutrese in there. I was a sureño soldier inside of there. And so I was a little different. So it was always so I had to now play this role fit this role from being this because i was always i was like a thug more than a cholo more than a gang member i was like a thug you know money and women and stuff like that rather than wanting to gang bang all the time even though i did gang bang got it and so it was it was a, so when i went started going to prison i had to change my identity to fit them man i've riots i got in a cell fight just to let people know you know i thank god because I, god's always been working a six foot two man inside of my cell literally this may even get, I don't know how graphic this may even be, but tried to rape me, you know? And I beat, man, I beat the living daylights out of him. I did. I protected myself for a while, and when I had the right chance, I was able to get in the right position, move, and get him in the right um, body lock, and then able to just destroy him with elbows to his face and, you know, literally almost kill him. Oh, but these, God. yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's just a little, I'm just telling you, I just told you this much of a story. Yeah. I no, I just think of either. what you said. Like once you're, I, this is sad. Uh, I only have exposure to this through, um, there was a show. I don't even remember the name of the show, but someone was being interviewed and he was saying the exact same thing about prison life where he, he was forced to become a certain way or he would die. He was absolutely forced into a character and you have to play that part. Like you said it, you have to play that part in order to yeah. survive, period. And that's all that's on his mind. He was saying, that's all that's on my mind. I don't care if I end up, as he would say, in the shoe, right? The segregated yes, house. I don't house care. Yeah. At that point, I don't care what the heck happens to me. There's this instinct, obviously, to protect your life. So. Yeah. Yeah. No. You know there, and it is. I like how you're talking about that because I'm actually going to be talking at a criminology conference. I was going to be discussing that because um, you know I'm a I'm 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 a sociologist right now, but I'm I'm in going to co uh, convict convict criminology, which is criminology is the study of crime from the outside. Oh. People are on the outside. They study the crimes. Convict criminology is actually a co ex convict studying the crime and going inside of it and but i, I want to be i want to talk about that because it is it's a strain it's it's you're almost being bullied you're being extremely influenced you choose what side you're on you come in who who are you with you may immediately go in you got the blacks the whites the hispanics 
the Mexicans from Mexico, not the Chicanos, not the Cholos, not the homies, but like the the border brothers, they have their they're really big in most jail systems. Then you have others. So then these are usually your five main groups right here. And they tell you, okay, who are you with? And so immediately in order for you to survive, then you see what's going on. Because like every day somebody's getting beat up. Every day somebody's getting stabbed. It's, and so you start saying, in order for me to survive and live my life to be comfortable, I have to play this part. Because I know a lot of guys who have been to prison before. I was a gang member before I went to prison. But there's a lot of guys that get there and they immediately, before they even get, so say in jail, they're fighting their case. Just to be like a chameleon, they'll shave their head, they'll start looking, they'll start taking on this cholo looking persona to save themselves. And yeah, every somebody dies in prison every day in America, the largest prison system in the world. But I believe in prisons, so I'm not an abolitionist. I don't, but a lot of people think that I am an abolitionist because I do put myself in those forums and talks. Sure. Um, and I'm, I'm not actually an abolitionist, I'm actually conservative. And so um, I would say that prisons are needed because there's a lot of bad things that are going on in the world and we need to reprimand people when they do these things because if not, they just will do it more and more and more and more. And we see it in our nation right now. What's going on when they're not reprimanding certain crimes? Sure. When there's, yeah, when there's, yeah, yeah when there's a lax approach, what do you think's going to happen? What, exactly. It's, it's the same for a child, right? Yeah. Like, oh, hey, don't do that again. See you later. Like, if there is absolutely no real consequence then what what do yeah. you expect can you speak yeah. to um and a lot of people real quick a lot of people don't realize i'm all tatted up too i just want people to see i'm all tatted up so even though i put religious art all over all over my gang tattoos but my complete body's a mosaic so 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 when people i've covered all my gang stuff with religious art you know um just so people know that's that's where i come from so when people see me they don't realize this is this is who they're talking to is this person. So all I have to do is cover my sleeves. I become a scholar. I'm no longer a convict. That easy like that. You Just know, then I come long out sleeves of it. on. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Then I come out of it and they're like, I didn't know you had all those tattoos. I'm like, hey, you didn't know a lot of things. God has a lot of stuff working on. That's he can awesome. Use a donkey. He can That's... use a donkey. He can use me. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I want to ask you about yeah. the was there a very strong ministry presence when you were in, you know, at various prisons. Do you remember anything related to ministry? Like hearing guys, uh, Hey, if you want to hear God's word, come to this so, area or how did, how did that work? Yeah. So it always felt like I was being touched over the years. So even when I was younger in the boys ranch, I remember there being a brother, John, he was a priest there, but I never talked to him. So I just got to like, let's keep going. Later on, every time I get locked up, there'd be somebody, Seven Day Adventists, Pentecostals, somebody always, you know, Baptists, all these different um, denominations reaching out. And so I always saw God's hand. I always saw him reaching out to me. I always saw him in times of need and stuff like that. But being incarcerated, I'll, now I'm going to fast forward, okay? So I'm going to kind of fast forward to, um, to, I was like 20... 27 years old. Yeah, I was about 27 years old. I had just had my son. I just picked up another case. I was about to do like 12 years in prison. I'm like, dude, my son's like four months old. Yeah. And I'm about to do all this time. He's my first son. And I'm like, really? This is, I was like, I can't believe this. Remember, I have no relationship with God. I have no relationship with God. But every time I get locked up, I'll pick up the Bible. I'll read it. It's, it's something to read while I'm in there, you know? So I would always pick it up and read so this time i'm in there and this priest is just like talking and i he's talking about jesus being the way he's talking about um coming to christ and i don't really remember what he said i really don't but i remember that i knew i was just feeling tired lost i just was feeling tired of being tired you know just so like out of my mind just like just living this life my entire life and it already been a long time by then because you're thinking yeah. 12 years old and now it's like 27 that's an in and out in and out non-stop party life party life party life this is my whole life was a party i never paid bills never had an apartment never cared about my credit score never took care of my family never you know never nothing i never did anything i never could hold a job more than three months i was a drug addict i was a, i was a i was a serious i was a complete loser a jehovah witness sees me from the cells because i'm crying boogers coming out of my nose 
I remember guys saying, I remember this to this day. Guys were saying, I can hear them saying, hey, why? They used to call me cuchillo, which means blade in Spanish. You know, blade, that used to be my name. So they said, because that would be my choice that I would rather want to use would be a knife um, than wanting to use a gun. Even though I did use a gun when I had to, but knives were always my thing. And they're like, why is he crying over there? Why is he crying? Why is it? And I had boogers and these are my whole homies. And I was just tired of being tired in this, 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 a black Jehovah witness too. I, I, I love, I, I'm not a racist. Everybody out there, I just want you to know that. But at that time, you got to understand who I was. You know, you got to understand what my mind was, who I was, where I was raised. Thank you, God, that he's transformed my life. But that's who I was at the time. And, and he knocks over there. I'm like thinking, my, like, what's this? What's this guy calling me over for? He was a Jehovah witness. And he started talking to me about Jehovah. And I read what the Bible teaches. And I read drawing, drawing close to Jehovah. And I read reasoning from scriptures, and I started getting the subscription of the Watchtower. I believe it was weekly or bi-weekly. And so we had the, the witnesses coming in and talking to us. Um, at that time, I was there for about a year, and I actually became an unbaptized publisher. Um, so inside the system still. Oh, and while I – yeah. So think about it. This was a year. So I'm really reading my scriptures. If you know anything about Jehovah Witnesses – is that they read the Bible. They read our Bible. Well, our our diluted version of our Bible, <laughs> how they changed it and manipulated it and made it all quirky now. But you know what? I, I would have the New World Translation on one side, and this is while I'm incarcerated, okay? And I would have a Good News Translation, a new, uh, um, a new King James Bible, an NLT, and a King James. And I would be studying every day, going through all these different doctrines and things that the witnesses were trying to teach me their doctrine. And then I could go into like my new King James study Bible. I like that new, what was it? The Thompson, Thompson new King James study Bible. And I was going through that. And I started reading about the teachings on the Trinity and stuff like that. And I go, Oh wow. And then I started seeing it here explicitly and other teachings that was teaching in there. And I'm going over to the witnesses and I'm seeing what it's teaching me. And I'm like, Oh, this isn't right. Why? Like with John 1, why would they change John 1? Why would they call Jesus a God? And why would they change that? Why do these Bibles have five times all the same? Even though there was something different in the Catholic Bible, I understand that. But at the time, I wasn't looking at that. I was looking yeah. at verses. What, the, what these verses, that they do all have the same, which when it came to all these Bibles, they were all the same when it came to the New Testament. They were words weren't changed even though they're kind of changed in the different translations it wasn't like the new world translation where they changed the entire meaning of a sentence and i started thinking about that i started looking at other stuff like jesus christ being the holy jesus christ being the archangel michael like what the jesus is the head over the archangel michael this doesn't make sense to me because jesus created everything but but the archangel michael isn't equal to the father and we know that the scriptures said that Jesus was equal to the Father in Philippians, you know. And so I see this. And if you see me, you see the Father. St. Michael never said nothing like that. There's a we can go through a lot of scriptures. St. Michael never said none of that. And so I started thinking about it at that time. Like, man, this is weird, too. Then the Holy Spirit being a force. And then when I saw with Ananias and Sapphira, when they lied to the Holy Spirit, lied to him. What happened? Then they, yeah. Yeah, what happened? Jesus said, I have to ascend so that the Holy Spirit can descend. And I'm like, whoa, something's going wrong over here. I saw this. Something's going wrong. And I saw other passages that, that they had changed. Plus, their false calling of the end of days. I think they've done it about 40 times, something like that. But that, they were big on that. Then everything in Charles Chase Russell's background and the fact that a man had found it, I just, it was just something and led me to Calvinism. So well incarcerated, I meet a Calvinist, and he draws me away from them. And I'm looking, and he's awesome, man. But <sighs> Tulip, okay, I I can partially, implicitly, implicitly see it or agree with it. But in the, to totally embrace it as a whole with salvation that's in Christ, I couldn't accept Tulip, especially like predestination. Sure. Um, um, the reprobate, and the, I studied with this guy for like six months, 
and I enjoyed it. I'm like, yeah, this this is more what I'm about. The Holy Spirit, I, I love what it's saying. I just felt comfortable with the teachings. Sure. But when we got to the reprobate, I was just like, this is nuts. And these guys are on fire. I'm not lying. This is at the beginning of my talk. So we're going to talk about these individuals, different people, but Calvinists later on in my journey, um, especially being in prison again, too. It's funny how we have these moments of transformation when we're in our pit. We're, in, we're at the bottom of our pit. And so after that, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna, okay, you know what? I'm going to go to a Calvinist Presbyterian church when I get out. Um, I end up not. I'm just like, I know I'm going to go back to the kingdom. I'm going to go to the kingdom hall. I'm already an unbaptized publisher. I never renounced them. I just wasn't talking to them. And oh yeah. And another thing with the Jehovah witnesses, man, during, they do communion once a year. Really? They do once a year. And they pass around bread inside of a plastic container and wine inside of a plastic cup and nobody drinks it. They pass it around just like the memorial, like the, the, the memorial. that's what they call it, the memorial. That's memorial. what they call it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, that's what they call it. Perfect word. You're good, man. So that's <laughs> that was yeah, a pure, no, that was a pure guess, man. So <laughs> no, 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 you're you're really good. And then what they do is they'll just pass it around. And wow. so I just want to say that just it just kind of threw me off there, especially when Jesus says, "As often as you eat my flesh, drink my blood." Good, you know? great, great point. Yeah. And, so you were. How often were you going there? Were you going weekly? Like so, there... so this is what happened. I get invited to it. When I get out, I get invited to go to Cornerstone Church of San Diego in National City, California. And so it's a non-denominational church. And so I get Pastor Sergio, he's an ex-Catholic. Remember, Calvinist, anti-Catholic. Joe Witness, anti-Catholic. Studying, when I did a little bit of studying with... Um, uh, was his um i can't remember the seven day adventist doug i used to do oh, a lot of his yeah doug um uh he he's been he's been, he's been around forever he, making the rounds i think trent horn recently re rebutted his teachings um yeah, so, i can't think of his name yeah yeah so i used to listen to him bachelor. too doug you know? bachelor yeah. doug bachelor yeah yeah amen yeah. amen yeah. so i used to do a lot of his studies every week they would send them to me even as not a Christian yet, I was doing those things. So I had ventured into this all messianics have a lot of anti-Catholicism. Big time the messianics. They put all kinds of propaganda out. Yahweh house and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So being in prison and then sending us all this propaganda for years, I became this anti-Catholic. So I go to this non-denominational church. But one thing I want to tell you, in my Christian walk, um, being a non a non-Catholic um, Christian. I was at that time. I could never get it right, bro. So I go to this non-denominational church. I drop to my knees. I ask Jesus for forgiveness. You know, I go to the altar call. It happened. I start going to this mega church. I start being a part of ministry. They're a big church too. I, thought, I think at the time we were like 3,000. But quick, within like two years, we were like at 10,000, one of the fastest growing churches in America. T.D. Jakes sponsored us. I got to meet him. Joel, Joel Osteen, just so you know, but he never went there. Only his wife and his mom did. He didn't go, never went to our church. Um, Joel Osteen, um, Joyce Myers. All the, the, all the big uh, non-denominational um, speakers, yep. All the big non-denominational speakers were there. Hezekiah, Bishop Hezekiah Walker. There was like the people from, um, um, and what was it called? What's that? Uh, You're pointing north? Are, you point, are you pointing north Where TBN, are you pointing? Oh, yeah yeah i'm pointing towards jesus yeah. tbn the cross yeah, yeah yeah tbn you know so they had all those people there but i can never get it right sure like you know i was i was part of the pastors the pastor had 12 then that 12 had 12 i sat on their 12 but i can never get it right i was always doing drugs i got married at the time through a group wedding at the church and cheating on her with a bunch of women that were in the church. Oh my God. Literally women would come and say hi to us. She didn't know, but they would come and say hi to me. Oh, hey brother. And then give her a hug and say hi to the kids. And I was just with the woman. I was calling people out left and right to go and fight, you know, thinking I was, they were, they were just being leaders and I wasn't being submissive. You know, it was just my fault. You know, just being on drugs. You can never get it right when you're on drugs. But for two years straight, I would have Bible studies in my house and, you know, 
was portraying to be something that I clearly wasn't. And I couldn't get out of why because the clearly the doctrines they never taught us about the Trinity. They never taught us about salvation. We never we never learned about you know they you don't learn the the facts that my salvation was given to me, but that I need to work it out with work out my salvation with fear and trembling. It was kind of like everything that I did on Sunday when I was at church or on Wednesday or at the Bible study was for God. Anything outside of that. It didn't matter just as long as I told Jesus that I was sorry. I could just continue moving forward. And I would never, I never believed that there would be a greater me. And I believe that stems from just my past and from being on drugs at the time. Yeah. And not really understanding what I was battling because I really didn't understand that. And so I go through that marriage. I was there for, like I said, I was there for like at least a couple of years. I go through that marriage. I leave. She leaves me. Of course, I wasn't a good husband. I wasn't being a good father. I do have a son. Bless his soul. There's a good for I'm going to say it at the end of this one real quick, because, you know, he hasn't actually talked to me um, when I got uh, when uh, let me just let me just continue telling my story. I don't want to go mess ahead. something up. No, go ahead. So I mean, I just got to continue telling the story. So then we, we end up separating. I'm in San Diego at the time. I, I come back to San Bernardino. I'm trying to get clean. But San Bernardino is where I'm from. So even if I'm not in San Diego no more, where I'm doing drugs, I no matter where I go, you can find it. There's no matter where you can go in the country, you're going to find drugs. Come back to San Bernardino. I'm really on drug living on the streets. I live in a tent. I'm homeless for like, like 10 months. I'm like 120 pounds. I'm losing my mind, sleeping in a ditch, oh my you know, God. Sh showering once a week. Yeah, just, just chasing drugs, chasing drugs, selling drugs, chasing drugs. Being with, you know, just I'm dirty. I'm being with dirty women. I'm dirty. Everybody's dirty around me, you know. We're homeless. We're living this lifestyle. And we don't care. And finally, I do meet a person. Well, let me say this. My wife was Catholic. I tore down every picture she had in her house that was Blessed Virgin, Jesus, whatever. Any kind of statue, I tore it down. So now move fast forward now. I'm trying to get my life together, but I can't. My son, I had custody of him at one time. He's with my mom. So now at this time, now that I moved to San Bernardino, I go that direction. This is like 2015. Okay. Yeah, this is this is like 2000. Yeah, this is 2015. I start dating somebody else in the 2014. I meet somebody. And once again, I manipulate somebody, you know, and I was very abusive to her mentally, physically, emotionally. I didn't know no other way. You know, I didn't have a good relationship with my mom. I'm making no excuses. I didn't have a good relationship with my mom. Certain women that I was supposed to be trusting in my life molested me when I was younger. Everybody says, oh, how can it be molestation when you were 12 years old? Hey, when you're 12 and they're 22, when you're 12 and they're 30, it is. That's what it is. Just because I'm a boy doesn't make it any different. Yeah. We always hide under the table. We always put it under the table. I could see why I didn't have a good relationship with women for a long time. I couldn't trust them. Um, and so I was very abusive to her. She was Catholic. I tore down all of her statues, ripped up all of her Mama Mary stuff that she had up in the house. We were going to a non-denominational church because people would just see a person on fire. Like I go to church, you know, they just see me on fire. And then when they leave, they didn't realize that I'm doing drugs on the side, that I'm being abusive on the side, that I'm not living my life right for Christ on the side. And so I'm living with this woman, and she's just like, she's going, I'm giving her the blues. God bless her. So I pray, I pray for all the time. I do. But everybody I've ever hurt. I'm not just telling you this story, but this story affects something internally inside of me. And that's why I have a passion and do everything that I do today for the Lord. And so she invites him because she's going with me. She's inviting me to her church. I'm like, I'm cool. I don't want to go to St. Peter and Paul. No, thank you. We're going to go to Abundant Living. She invites a friend over that friend was a convert. Her husband also was a convert. And I didn't know that at the time. Big time convert. I didn't realize he was a theologian, to be honest with you. Now I know to this day he's my godfather. Now he is to this day. You know, he's my good buddy. I just talked to him yesterday on the phone. But I didn't know at the time. So they come over and I even leave. I met her first and she was feisty. I was thinking, man, this is a Catholic. She knows the Bible. <laughs> what is this? Who is this? I know that's why she invited her friends over, my the girls at the time, because she was scared probably. Sure. She wanted to invite somebody who knew scriptures over because she knew that was my passion. Even though I was this abusive tweaker, 
She knew I loved reading Bible. I knew I loved reading the scripture. I couldn't help it. Even when I was all tweaked out on drugs, I would be listening to like sec like um contemporary Christian music, you know, and, and reading the Bible all the time. I couldn't help it. I still wanted him. My heart was still longing for him. My 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 spirit was willing, but my my flesh was weak, and it's real. When that statement said like that, I, I knew it. I lived it, I lived like that for a long time. A lot of people are living like that. They're not living in the victory that we have in Christ. And he can do it because we just think these things about um, who we are from our past, you know. And so now they come over. And so, like, he, they invite him over. They come over. And the wife, like I said, the wife's answering all these questions of mine. She invites him over. This time, I'm prepared when he comes over. I'm living anti-Catholic books all over the house. Wow. I want him to see him. I want him to see him. Even in the restaurant, I opened the Bible to don't call no man. And I highlighted it. We talk about this and laugh to it to this day. And his wife did. She actually brought it up to me the other day. Uh, it, was cute. it was cute what she did because they're a big part of the reason why I'm Catholic. I highlighted don't call no man father except for your father in heaven. So we're going bing, we're going back and forth, me and Joshua. We're bing, 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 bing. we're going back and forth. He's I'm asking him questions. He's answering them with the scripture. I didn't know that not only was Joshua a convert, um, but Joshua had written books against the Catholic Church. He had been a graduate of like Calvary, and now he was like in South Carolina at some seminary, you know. And they were all going through seminary to become like um, Protestant pastors, you know. And so then all of a sudden, I, you can't really see it, but it's Can called... you move it over just a little bit? Yeah, right there. Evangelical Exodus, edited by Douglas Beaumont and forward by Francis Beckwith. Okay. Yep. Oh, yes. Yep. I saw I interviewed Douglas Beaumont about yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So he he was part of he was going to that. Same... He's one of them. He's one of them. Oh, okay. He's one of the guys who wrote the stories in here. I didn't know at the time. And then he wrote a book with Scott Hahn. Like you'd have to look it up to see which one it is. I didn't know this at the time. And when I talked to people, they're like, I didn't read. He was so humble. He never told me nothing. Yeah. And so like I was to the point where I was like, I want to knock him out. I'm a guy. Even to this day, sometimes I'm too much of a gangster for God. <laughs> You know, I, I don't even lie. I'm not lying. Sometimes when people are talking about the Catholic Church or something, like we're, we're, we'll have a good collective conversation. But when people start going ad hominem, yeah, and start attacking the Pope or things about the Church, that just really flusters me. And I and I really just want to. It's good training, my, though. It's good training for all of us. Put my foot in them, you know. You know what I mean, though. Is it not true? Like it's yeah, no, at this, it it's so with with the internet it's so darn rampant compared to yeah. you know what I mean it, these these videos that can go out to millions of people very quickly it's yeah. it's good training for us to I don't know prepare like you were saying so okay sorry I didn't want to derail there so he's, no, he's no, going no, no, back and forth and do you at any point where you're like okay good rebuttal or were you just so proud you're like okay what about this what about this yeah you know no he he could rebuttal everything and it was gonna be mad where i wanted to fight him oh shoot i wanted i actually walked out the house i slammed the door and he went outside and he says he says eric hey can i talk to you and he came out and he followed me out there and i'm like i look at him like this dude's humble this dude is humble i was thinking in my head and he goes you want to go with me to mass on on sunday on saturday, well, saturday it was I'm like, oh, we'll take you to lunch. And he got me with lunch, you know. You can always, when you guys are evangelizing, buy a lunch or a dinner, you'll get them every time. That is good, <laughs> man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so just throw a meal out there. Great evangelization tool. Starts right with there. a meal, yeah. Hey, there's yeah, a there, yeah. there's a book title right there, man. Seriously. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so then all of a sudden, I'm like, all right, cool. But well, when we go there, he kind of got me a little bit. Um, because he kind of got me a little bit because it was actually, no, no, this is what happened. I went to mass with my girlfriend. After I met with Josh, I, I went to one mass with her. That St. Peter and Paul, we went. And while I was in there, this is before the, before I went with Josh, I remember being in there and looking around and I'm like, 
oh, this is kind of weird, man. You know, like all these statues. But my grandma was Catholic. She was a strong Catholic. Just let me just throw that one out there. Over strong Catholic. Her novenas were powerful. And so I'm looking around. I'm like, okay, they're kneeling at Mama. They're kneeling at, at the time. I was just saying Mary at the time, but I say Mama now. They're kneeling at Mama over there. I'm like, okay, this is kind of like I'm kind of tripping out. There's all these different statues. And but as it went along, I started listening because I'm a Bible reading Christian at that time. Still a Bible reading Christian, Bible reading Catholic Christian. Yeah. But I'm listening to the liturgy and I'm like, that's the Bible. Wait, that's scripture. That scripture, everything was so appealing. And I just wanted more of it. And I remember at one of the times they were singing, I had my hands up like this. I don't do that now, but I had my hands up singing like this because my Protestant ways days, you know, but I have my hands up like this. And I'm singing a song and somebody goes, it's an usher because I had a Kangle. It's a real nice $50 Kangle hat. You know, like the little mobster yeah. Kangle hats. Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And I know you're not supposed to wear hats now. Back then, I, did, I didn't know that because of the, at Protestant churches, everybody wears their hats inside. At the non-denominational churches that I was going to. And I remember just looking at him like, man, you just killed my flow, man. You know what? F the Catholic church. Wow. I thought in my head and we went home and I was a little frustrated, kind of got over it, but I was a little frustrated, you know, then Josh invited me. I went with him to this talk. It was at Sacred Heart Chapel in Covina, California, actually where Virgin Most Powerful Radio, oh, radio. is. <laughs> yeah. So that's so and behind it. See, this is going to this story. That's what I'm saying. This story is so huge, bro. And it's so like this is God doing this. Because it's full circle. This is just the beginning of something that's going to start transforming me. But when we get to the, the next part of the story, it's going to seal it. You're going to be like, what? How can that even be? So remember, I'm not Catholic, anti-Catholic. I'm at Virgin Most Powerful Radio Studios is behind Sacred Heart Chapel. So Sacred Heart Chapel's here. Terry Barber owns it. I didn't know this, but Joshua Benton Courts, because Joshua's a, a convert, his mentor, I didn't know what the, I didn't know who Terry Barber was at the time. His mentor is Terry Barber. One of his best friends is Jesse Romero. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know Jess, that Josh was this big, heavy theologian. I didn't know none of this stuff. I just said, this guy's paying attention to me. If I would have known this now, it would back then it would have been different because I'm like, dude, this guy's paying attention to me. This guy's a theologian. He's like, Dude's got his stuff together, you know, but he did. God did put it in his heart for him to care about me. And we're at this conversion story. Fred Krauss, he's a convert, and, a, and another man named Paul Clay. Paul Clay, shout out if you ever watch. I know you're going to watch this because I'm going to send it to you, Paul. Um, He's the host of Jesus 911 okay. on Virgin yep. Most Powerful Radio, and I've been on that show, and he's a good friend of mine. Everybody over there at Virgin Most Powerful Radio are great friends of mine. Hey, shout out to oh. Gary Machuda, too. Yeah, yeah. Gary! Yep. Have me on your show, Gary! <laughs> Watch it for you, Gary! <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, so um, so we're going there. I'm listening to them talk, but I hear them bashing Protestantism, and I kind of get frustrated. Because remember, I'm still high. I'm still using drugs. I'm still living this life, so like I'm still kind of like, I'm some kind of thug. I'm still out here doing this thing. I'm still sleeping with all kinds of chicks. Still beating up people every once in a while. You know, I'm still in my addiction. You know, a work functioning addict. You know, working, surviving, living yeah. with this woman now. And so then what happens is, what happens is now is that I walk out. I kick the pew. I walk out. I get all mad. And I take a, a walk around the block. And I come back. It's an old church. So it's like 100 years old, over 100 years old. The restroom's on the outside. You know, they built it to where you could come through the inside now, but you go from the outside and this old lady comes out and I don't know who she is, but I was outside just standing there kind of like this, you know, and she looks at me and she goes, what's wrong? And I was like, hey, I'm Protestant and I'm really offended by what I hear in there. And she just goes like this. And she goes, you know, I just I remember this moment like it was just yesterday. And she goes, you have been brought here for a reason. Just open your heart. And listen to why God's called you here. And she gave me the biggest hug. She gave me the biggest hug in the world. She was, you know, I just, she went in and come in when you want, you know, come in whenever you want. I just thought like, wow. And then I walked over to the statue of Mama Mary. And I remember looking at her in her face. And I just remember like, literally I was cussing, like, why do they have you here? And now I'm crying. 
now now the tears are flowing down now I'm I'm struggling with myself now I'm crying I'm struggling and um I'm like why do they have you here like why are you here you know and I just sit there and I'm just thinking in my head like why isn't Jesus here I really did over and over and I, it's like, I remember that I, I can remember like it was yesterday and it was almost like a premonition. I got a picture from here, a premonition, like something came over me and says, because your eternal salvation comes from my womb. And I just started thinking like, God, you know, I know God couldn't even, Jesus, I mean, most didn't even see the backside of God. And I just started, I just started crying. I said, you know, I said, you're right. You're right. I can see you in a different light now. I don't have to see you as just this like, yeah. you, you gave birth to Jesus, pass you on and you're, I can see you kind of like um, I, I can see you in a whole other light now of love and you know it was just different. It was just different, but it wasn't gonna change still, bro. I was too caught up too much, so I went back in there, listened to the talk. It was awesome. Go for it. We're gonna have to pause and oh, okay. Do that'll be the segue to part two, for sure. Amen. And so it'll just so just so we remember this part. We're going to go into the part where we leave Virgin Most Powerful Radio Studios. Now we're going to go on to attending Mass, RCAA, and going to Curcio. Okay. And what happens after that? As a non-Catholic, so I'm still a non-Catholic. I'm still an anti-Catholic. <laughs> Beautiful. Brother, thank you for part one. Thank everyone. Um, I, I thank everyone that will come across this video. Um, looking forward to part two. I will reach out. We'll figure it out hopefully soon. We can do something. Yeah. yeah. A traditional urban Christian. Yes. If anybody, please, I, I, I wanted to post it on, but I just want to take it slow. I want to just kind of like. No, no, no. Traditional listen, urban I, Christian YouTube channel. Absolutely. YouTube channel. Check it's, it all, out. It's, it's Catholic content, just little shorts that I'm putting on there. We're going to start going a little heavier with it this month. Um, support any feedback you guys have, please. It's all it's all for the church, for Christ. So we can put up our dukes and fight for what's going on in this world right now. Put up our dukes. Amen. I love it. And take people out to lunch. And we're going to be back with part two. Soon. Yeah. God bless you, brother. God bless you too, brother. Love you. Love you too.